Hi, welcome to the signal pad. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is a GW Instec APS1102. This is a programmable AC DC power source. And as you can see from the front, it actually has a multi purpose AC plug essentially where you can plug anything into it and control it and power it from this. Now, so why did I even bother buying this one? Well, I do have a Sencor. PR570, which is an isolation transformer, adjustable isolation transformer, and it allows me to bring up equipment that are broken, or if I'm repairing, let's say, a power supply, it allows me to work with it safely and bring it up slowly. And, you know, that has some good advanced functions. It has current limiting and leakage detection and so on. But this is a far more advanced instrument, and it can do sequencing and some other fancy things, including, of course, providing a DC power source. I don't know if it can change the frequency or not, but we can take a look at it. So I picked this up from eBay uh, for about $400, which is not cheap. It's still fairly expensive. And again, I can do that thanks to my Patreon supporters, which enable all of these things, of course. And even if we can't fix this, I'm still interested in taking it apart and see how it works, what kind of architecture it uses. This is almost certainly a solid state architecture, so I'm curious to see what they've done to enable you know, the advanced functions it has. It's actually quite large also. We'll, I'll show you the back and see what kind of interfaces it has, but I'm eager to see if we can figure out what's wrong with it. And here's the back of the instrument. You can see it also has the output brought into the terminals in the back. One KVA maximum and plus fun minus 400 volt peak maximum. That's where the power goes in to, of course, power the instrument. And it's made in Japan, straight up, so that's nice to see. And we have USB and I/O control and some external signal in for synchronization. So it's you know a fairly advanced unit. And this was actually calibrated based on a sticker on the top in 2018, valid until 2019. So it must have been working not too long ago, and it's in fantastic shape. It looks almost brand new. So I think at this point we should turn it on and see what happens. All right, power on sequence, it's plugged in. Here we go, nice, backlight is on. Loud beep, we see it has a version 1.5 and a USB ID is there. And there's a problem right there. So system locked communication failure two. So it, obviously something inside, some processor is trying to communicate with something else and it can't and it just basically disables the whole thing. There's absolutely nothing you can do. There's nothing else you can do to get into any of the sub menus or systems. And I looked at the manual, there's no schematic or even a block diagram, but they say that if you get this, send it back to GW Instec, which of course we're not going to do. We're gonna try and take it apart and see what's going on inside. And check this out. Look how long it takes after I turn it off for it to actually turn off. It's going to take a while. <laughs> that's, that's a long time. So I wonder if that is some kind of shutdown sequence or it's just a big capacitor that's holding the charge. All right, I think I got all the screws off. We can take a look at this for the first time together. Let me see, yeah, this should slide right off. And what do we have here? <laughs> wow, that's a, there's a lot of stuff in there. That's a pretty complicated instrument, but I do think it is indeed solid state based. That's, there is two other PCBs down there. Big heat sinks at the top. The main processing unit seems to be the one on the side. Interesting way of getting the USB port out. I wonder where that goes. I don't think it goes to the front because I don't see a USB port in the front. But yeah, pretty cool. So we're just not gonna have to figure out what is talking to what and what could have possibly gone wrong. Uh, so the communication failure is probably coming from something over here not working because it looks like this part in the here that's actually connected to the front. So this is what's driving the display. So this uh, controller is figuring out something is wrong somewhere else. So let me take a little bit closer look at it and scan over it a little bit and then we can go over it piece by piece. So I spent a little bit of time going over the different boards and figuring out what's connected to what, and now I have a little bit of a better idea of what to look for. So this board at the top is called the PFC inverter, maybe power factor correction, power factor controller, I'm not sure yet. And the board in the middle and the board at the bottom have, are labeled at two different kinds of inverters. Obviously all of these boards are responsible for generating the AC and the DC signals and potentially putting some imperfections on the AC line. So you can stress test your device that you connect to the front. So that's whatever is going on from the AC. Now over here, this main board is quite interesting because this also has multiple different domains on it. I assume that this instrument probably has many power domains, galvanically isolated in strategic places to make sure that you know whatever needs to talk to whatever, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same potential. And that's important for power supplies, of course. Now on the right side over here, this area is connected to the USB and the digital IOs in the back. So this thing is galvanically connected to the user and therefore it has to be isolated very carefully. And if you look on this left side, there's a dotted line around this section that's connected to this connector with all these cables going to the top. And this appears to be almost entirely isolated. 
And if I look this at this dotted line, that's probably where the isolated section is. By the way, this instrument has really, really good silk screen. There's a lot of voltages and test points labeled. You can actually see what you're supposed to measure. So it's super handy, even though there is no schematic. Now, this USB here is nothing more than just the front panel that uh, controls the LCD screen. Nothing unusual there. So if I look at this a little bit, this obviously has to get power from somewhere. Now if I look at this portion, this portion is coming and connected to this one, which means that this connector here is bringing power into this board in some way and getting potentially some digital data out, controlling this, whatever is in the backside. Now this one over here seems to be fairly well isolated from this connector, which means that the power from to this one is either coming from here or there may be some inner layers that connect these connected to this one. And I think in order to answer that, we need to x-ray this board so we can at least understand what is connected to what. So when we trace out the power supplies, we can actually figure out if everything even makes sense. There are a lot of labels here which I would like to measure. So I propose before we do anything else, get an x-ray of this, which would be helpful during the debugging and then we can put it back and do some actual measurements on it. Here we go, the board's inside the x-ray machine, and now we're going to get some nice images. All right, so here's the photograph of that board. You can see this is the area we're interested in, and that's the area where the one connector comes in and the other connector leaves the board. Now, I already took some x-rays, and here it is. So in this x-ray, we can see that there is definitely a connection from this bottom connector to this connector at the top. So there is, and these are thick lines, so definitely some kind of power is being fed to the other board. So we have to watch out for that on the other carrier, the big board at the top of the instrument. We have to see where this thing ends up. Now I took an x-ray with a different exposure and you can see this line actually disappears because it doesn't have the, the correct power. But now you can clearly see that there is a section in the middle of this board that has a completely different power supply. It's fully isolated. It's also pretty cool to see the opto isolators, how they're fully galvanically isolated, as well as these IOs that are also isolated as well. So this is, a, this is how these two boards actually talk to each other. There's nothing else between them. There's no metal between them. That's kind of nice to see. And there's a big IC here in the middle. You can see the capacitors, for example. So this is almost definitely a DC-DC converter. And you can see a couple of other power supplies that enter this board. So looking at this, I'm fairly convinced that this board is powered through this connector at the left. So we go over here, it means that this section of the board is powered somehow through this connector. But the connection going from this, following this mouse, all the way to this corner should not be ignored. And we have to follow that as well. You can see there's 1.8 volt lift written here, 3.3 volts written here. So we will definitely be able to check those. And here's the opto isolators that you can see in this one. That's what they look like under the x-ray. So we have a lot of information now. We can put this board back into the instrument and make some measurements, check out those power supplies, and even you know find out if there's a way to separate this board and maybe run it just by itself. And I'm suspecting that that digital problem may actually be from this side. Because if you look, this is a, some kind of a serial link or some kind of an I.O. interface between these two boards. So if this processor board at the very top here, which you cannot see in the x-ray, it's right above on this side. If this board is not able to talk to this one, it would generate an, some kind of an error. So that's kind of my intuition. So let's go ahead, back to the instrument, make some measurements and figure out if that's correct. Okay, so here we are now looking at the top of the instrument. This is the big ribbon cable that's coming from the board we just saw the x-ray of. And if I look at this, it's beginning to make more sense. So some power enters this. And I think that if you look, there's a little bit of a dotted line around here as well. And that DC power, whatever that is coming into here, goes into this chip. And this is actually a switching power supply IC. And I believe this then generates a minus 5 volt and a plus 5 volt. And those two then are fed back onto this and onto the other board. So we should be able to measure these plus and minus 5 volt power supplies and make sure they're okay. If they're okay, that means power is reaching the other board and that entire link is working. So that's a pretty good place to start. So I'm going to turn this on. Okay, so I've connected the multimeter on the ground side to the input of the switching power supply. Remember this transformer here isolates the switching power supply from the other side. So we have to measure differently on each side. The ground is connected, so this should be the input power V in, there you go, 24 volts, that's good. So that's what's coming from the other board. So we already saw that in the x-ray, those were the two lines. I'm going to take this ground, I'm going to move it to the other side, connect it to the other side of this. I'm going to make sure I don't touch anything else. There we go. Looks good. I already tested those, uh, these heat sinks that they're not live, of course. I took the precautions. And let's try and see if we can find the minus 5 volt. Here's the minus 5 volt. And what do we have? Ooh, minus 2.5. That does not look good. It should certainly be minus 5, so that doesn't work. 
What about the plus 5 volt? No, nope, 1.15. There we go. So we already see a problem. There's also a plus 12 volts. And 11 and a half, okay, that one's not bad, acceptable. So the plus and minus 5 volts don't work. And that's not a good sign. I'm surprised because there is a and 7805 here, this is a 7805, this is a 7905, so that's plus and minus 5 volt regulators. So these regulators should work. I mean, there's no reason for them to, to be doing this unless they're heavily loaded. Let me touch one. Oh yeah, that's pretty hot. Okay, so that means that something is loading them heavily. Let's see if we can verify that. So it's fairly clear that this bottom board, whatever is happening over here, is loading that plus and minus 5 volt power supply. Now if I remove this, unfortunately, I won't be able to measure it anyway because there is power coming from here and then coming back. But I can remove this cable and just bypass everything. I know wh where I need to connect my 24 volt power supply onto this board and then we can see if the plus and minus 5 volt power supplies come back when they're not connected to this circuit. This is an easy way to verify if they're really being loaded heavily by this board. That's a good debugging step. All right, so I removed that ribbon cable. You can see it's completely gone, and I brought in the actual 24 volts directly from the bottom to the top. So basically, we only have that one connection. These two cables are the only, only interface between the bottom board and the top board. Now let's those measure those voltages again. So we, had, we should have minus 5 here. There you go, minus 4.9. That's much, much better. I wonder if this regular has aged a little bit and it's not regulating as well as it used to. And let's see the plus 5 volt one. There you go, plus 5 volts. Okay, so that already pretty much confirms that the bottom board is loading the top board somehow through that ribbon cable. The power supply section in here indeed is working, at least good enough for our purposes. Now, it could be that these are ghost voltages and you have to load them to see the effect but it's very unlikely for both of them to be like that. So I'm you know, reasonably convinced that those regulators are working. If I touch them now, yep, they are now completely cold. There you go, that's good. So it means that that, that part of the circuit is indeed back to life. So now we can turn our attention to the bottom board again. All right, now let's do some thermal imaging. This should be pretty straightforward. I just have the thermal imager pointed directly at the area underneath the connector. So you can see my fingers there. Uh, this is the connector coming in, and this is the area that I'm interested in looking at. See if we find anything of issue. I'm going to turn it on. And let's see. Let's see. Oh my God, look at that. Well, that's the first beep. So it's going to do the second beep and the communication failure. There you go. Wow, those components are hot. They're already reaching almost 90 degrees Celsius, and there's three of them. I can find out where they are. Is my finger? Yeah, these are super hot. So these three components all look like op amps, actually. I have to take a closer look. Interestingly, the DC-DC converter is right here, and it's totally cold. And if you look all over the board, I don't see anything else light up. Well, not naturally, because these are at 90 degrees Celsius, so everything else is kind of swamped out. But yeah, three components, and they appear to be identical. So why have they died? That's a good question. And uh, we can also find that measure around and make sure that the power supply is indeed the same power supply we just measured. But I think it is. These things are probably clamping it down. Look at that, 94 degrees Celsius. I'm going to turn this off now. Okay, so now we have something concrete. We understand the power supply flow. And this also explains why we're not getting any communication. Because if those power supplies are clamped down, the processor, which is down there, is not going to produce anything, it's not even turned on, and therefore there is no communication to it. So now we finally can explain why we have the communication failure. So the three suspect op amps are this one, this one, and this one, and they're indeed all identical. There's no difference between them. This one is sharing the same power supply, but it doesn't seem to have any issue. Now three identical op amps to die at the same time, why would that happen? I mean, I can see if, let's say, the power supply has some weird behavior, but those voltage regulators look reasonably good so I'm not so sure what's going on we're going to remove them uh, because there's something's definitely wrong with them anyway and if I remove them and let's say the whole power supply comes back and there's nothing else wrong that's already a pretty step big step forward and then we can then replace them is it possible that all three of them have something loading their output uh, that's a bit skeptical each of these has two operational amplifiers on the inside of it so I think removing them and running it without the op amp is probably not a bad idea all right, I removed the op amps. You can see the, the three footprints all cleaned up. So without it, we're going to run the instrument and measure the power supplies again. Okay, so let's start from the plus and minus 5 volt power supply. Everything is not connected, except obviously the op amps are not there. Let's see, this should be 5 volts. Ah, look at that. So the 5 volt power supply has returned. This should be the minus 5 volt, which was always a little bit low. There you go, minus 
that's also working. That's great. So the power supplies are not back, so they're not being loaded by those damaged op amps. There's a DC-DC converter here, which is supposed to generate 1.8 volts and 3.3 volts. We can go ahead and measure those two. That's what's powering the entire processor down here. So measuring this one. There you go, 1.8. That's a very good sign. So that's that supply is working. Where's our 3.3? Here's our 3.3. And that looks good too. Okay, so that entire station has not come back to life. That's a really good sign. It's probably time to order some parts now. Well, check this out. The error changed. It no longer says internal communication error. It now says DCPS failure, which is some kind of a maybe DC power supply failure. And this is not a reliable error, of course, because it's missing those op amps. And those op amps were probably part of some kind of detection circuit or some kind of drive circuit. And that might be why it's not working. So we've indeed changed the nature of the error. And I think this is a step forward. All right, so I received the parts from DigiKey and I decided to change all the four op amps, even the one that wasn't heating up, the one that wasn't broken, just so that they are all matched from the same batches, from the same manufacturer. At the same time, I replaced the 7805 and the 7905, the plus and minus 5 volt regulators, because I think they had aged, and as you saw, the negative one, for example, wasn't very good at all. So now we should have hopefully a nice symmetric plus and minus 5 volt supply. I have done the same thing I did before. I've bypassed the ribbon cable, only powering the DC-DC converter up here from the voltage coming from the bottom, just so we can make sure that the plus and minus 5 volt supply is actually working and it's accurate. So I think everything's wired up correctly. So I'm going to put this on the 5 volt supply so we can catch it as it powers on. Here we go. There you go, that's nice. 5 volt, that's very good. So the 7805, the replacement is working. And the 7905... There you go, minus 5 volt. So we've got a very nice symmetric plus or minus 5 volts as expected with the brand new parts. Now the exciting part, we connect the ribbon cable back and try again. Okay, all back together. Here's the moment of truth. Let's see. So far, no explosions. That's always a pot plus. Okay, let's see if it gets past this point. Come on, you can do it. There we go, look at that. We booted, no more errors. Okay, so I think we should take a closer look at this GUI and see what's going on with it. Well, of course, as soon as I finish repairing the circuit, I go back and there is a block diagram which describes the operation of the system, at least in a very simplified block diagram. There is really no actual description, there is no schematic, but yeah, I found this only after I repaired it. But nonetheless, we can look at it and see if we kind of reverse engineered it correctly. So the board at the very top of the instrument is this, this is the PFC inverter it actually does the power factor correction because it's what's connected to the ac line that's where the ac line comes in that sub dcps circuit that's the circuit that generates the power supply isolated that powers that entire system controller board which is the one over here and that power goes over here and it powers another dc dc converter and that dc dc converter was the part we were measuring with ldos right after it all these isolators these are the what separates the two boards so there's some opto isolators here that completely isolate this portion, the bottom of the circuit from the top. So all of that kind of now makes sense. So the second error that we saw, the DCPS failure, is actually the failure of this, which means those op amps that I thought were somehow to do with monitoring of the voltages of the power supplies and conditioning them were indeed doing exactly that. They were monitoring this. So when those op amps you know, reported something some pro problematic, it thought that the DCPS power supply was broken. So indeed, uh, all of that makes sense, and it's consistent with what we thought it is. It's also interesting to see how they have designed the actual amplifier. So this is indeed fully isolated. As you can see, there is transformers here. So this is not connected galvanically to the line coming in, which is great. So it's similar to what an isolation transformer would do. But they have replicated this amplifier twice, it seems. And uh, there's a range changer here, which both of them come to. I think what happens is when you put it into a higher range, in order for it to be able to achieve voltages higher than the AC line you put into it, it puts them in series, it looks like. So you, they essentially run them in parallel. And if you need to go to 250 volts from a 120 you know, volt AC line, just put them in series. And I think that's what this is. And this range changer is almost certainly all done with relays. I don't, there's, there's no need for this to be a solid state, of course. And there are, these power amplifiers are all have their own protection, current limits, and all the fancy things to make this work. So as you can see, it's quite complicated, and this block diagram probably doesn't do it justice, but at least we got the rough idea of how it works. So, looks good. 
Okay, so the very first thing I did, I reset the instrument to a factory setting. So we can take a look and see what's going on. In terms of the modes, there's quite a few things you can do. You can apply a lot of different types of waveforms, not just applying a, a sinusoid to the load. You can apply even an arbitrary waveform. So it's really quite advanced. Uh, there's two ranges, 100 volts and 200 volts. I set it to 100 here in North America where I live. It's 100 volts, of course. Uh, the frequency default is 50 hertz, which is not what we want. So let's make that... 60 hertz, which means that we can, of course, change the frequency, you can change the phase. Here is when you can apply any kind of arbitrary waveform you want to your load. Very cool stuff. And then there's a maximum peak current limit that it applies, as well as an average current it applies. Uh, under miscellaneous, you have memories, you can sequence your waveforms. Very cool. Different limit stuff, you can tell it what it measures. And uh, yeah, looks good. Let's see, I don't want to do that anymore. So output is turned off. Okay, I think uh, I haven't actually turned the output on yet. And you can see the buttons at the bottom. Actually, you can't see the just buttons at the bottom that uh, allow you to run a particular sequence. And on the left side, you can do the measurement. It measures the voltage, the power, you know, the different kinds of parameters. It measures the, uh, the phase and power factor, uh, all that stuff that you would expect from power analysis. So first is, we should hook it up to an oscilloscope and see if it's producing the correct waveform. And then maybe we can stress that something that I have in the lab. Okay, so let's talk about our measurement setup here. So here's the GW Instec uh, in the middle here. And at the top, I have a high voltage differential probe. These are fully isolated. The output of this goes into an oscilloscope on the right, which I will show you in just a second. I have a tiny little 130 volt light bulb here, which I'm using as a pure resistive load. It's a nice load that it doesn't change the shape of the waveforms, allows us to monitor the quality of the waveform directly from the GW Instec without having it floating. So there's actually some load at least. Then I have a current probe here, which is monitoring the current going into the light bulb of course and on the right side those two things are being measured by the setup right over here sorry about the camera we have here an uh, key site the dso x3104 and this is going to have channel one voltage channel three is our current probe and i have a power supply here that powers the probe so we should be able to now see how it works and here we go so we're going to do this measurement with this instrument set to ac plus dc so we can get both of them at the same time so we can see the dc performance too these two scales that you see in the measurements on the right side have already been appropriately scaled for the differential probe and the current probe so right now the output is turned off and the voltage is zero let me turn it on nothing changes of course because uh, we're not applying anything so let's apply some ac voltage there's 10 volts oh look at that we do indeed see a sinusoid it's a beautiful sinusoid Okay, here's 80 volts as an, ex as an example. And let's see if this makes any sense. So it's measuring 79.9 volt RMS. Look at that, 79.8 volt RMS on the oscilloscope. Very good. It's measuring 0.06 amp RMS roughly. This is measuring about a little bit less than that. Uh, the measurement on the current is probably not very accurate because this is a 30 amp probe and we're not using it in a very good part. We're using it at this lowest kind of range it has. It's not very accurate probably. This also might need calibration, of course. And uh, let's see, we can change the frequency, which is very cool. Here we go. Very nice. Look at that. Yeah, we can change the frequency. It's very good for some motors. If you use this on motors, of course, you can control their speed in some situations. Uh, let's try a different sinusoid. Oh, it's a square wave. Look at that beautiful square wave coming out. And uh, of course, here you can see that the current and the voltage are perfectly in phase because we're dealing with a purely resistive load. And I can actually hear it now because it's a square wave and the harmonics of it are now in the audible range. Let's turn that back to a sinusoid. And uh, the power factor doesn't show up here because it's probably below the measurement it can make. This is a very, very tiny load, so it doesn't show anything. It's unfortunate. I would have liked to see it show, but from the range, you can see that it is, it's expecting much larger loads, heavier current flow through the device. Uh, let's try some DC. Let me turn this uh, AC completely off. Uh, let's see how the DC works. Oh, look at that. Very nice. Of course, the light bulb doesn't care, of course, about whether it's DC or AC. It's a 100 volt DC. Let's see how accurate it is. 99.9 .9 volt RMS. And, oh, this is not going to show anything, but you can see it's right on the 100 volt range. It's because I'm measuring AC RMS only, but it's right on 100. Very nice and accurate. Uh, same current. This, again, is not going to show up, but I think it's in the right place. Very good. It's amazing. So we should be able to combine these. So let's say a 30 volt DC can put AC on top of it. Yep, absolutely it works. No problem. Very good. I have to say I'm very happy that I managed to fix this because as you know, I was trying to replace my 
other isolation transformer. And now, we, now that we saw the block diagram, we see that this is indeed a fully isolated instrument as well. So it's going to have a lot of use cases. But anyway, I think we can stop here. I'm fairly satisfied with it. It's a PC control software too, but I think that's going to be no issue at all. Uh, yeah, it's good. Let me know what you think in the comments section. I have a whole bunch of other instruments still to repair waiting in the queue, but this turned out to be a good one. I'll see you in the comments section.